You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Welcome back, everyone, to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. This is Trevor Wade. I'll be hosting today. And I'm joined by the director of hunting ops, Alan Gingrich. How's it going, Alan? Good, good. Yeah. So today we got a we got a fun podcast to talk about. We're gonna we're gonna settle in on rules for a while. Uh, we we haven't done a lot of rules in the past couple of weeks, getting ready for for some upcoming events and whatnot. But uh, I think we we got a pretty good a good couple of rules here to talk about. Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah. So, but uh, before we get there, we got a little bit of breaking news. It actually just happened before I came downstairs today. But uh, as you guys know, we talked about it in the past past episode and on, on social media and whatnot, zone four for the world championship. Uh, we had a, we, it was in Palmyra last year, this year, they got some stuff going on. They're not able to host it, but we were able to talk to uh, the Missouri Coon Hunters Federation, uh, Mike Hayworth, Phil Vogel, those guys. And uh, they're, they're a good centralized location. And it's going to be at the uh, Missouri state fairgrounds in Sedalia, Missouri this year. Yeah. So that's actually not that far from uh, where Palmyra was. So yeah. Right. Move up the road a little bit. That's yeah. it. Yeah, not far at all. We wanted to keep it there in North Central Missouri somewhere, and I think uh, I think that's going to be a really good spot. And eh, it's always encouraging whenever the host clubs excited, the people in the area excited yeah. to have the zones in their area. Yeah, and they'll do a great job with it. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, as we're as we're taping here today, it's it's uh, uh, just right here after the Tournament of Champions deadline. We had a great entry uh, up over eight hundred dogs this year for the first time in its three year history. Uh, so appreciate everybody getting entered in, but I think it's a good time probably to talk about deadlines because it feels like this whole week we've been kind of dealing with that. It is, you know, it's it's an exciting time, you know, we get a bunch of entries. We're excited for the TOC and everything, and then uh, we have the advanced entry deadline, and it never fails. And I feel like we have never put out more information on on deadlines and all this and that than we have this year. Every year we've just got more platforms. And we've done it, but there's always some that just don't seem to get the memo. And it's, it's uh, frankly, it's pretty discouraging. And it's sometimes it's tough to deal with. We, we get it, you know, understand, you know, some folks just missed it for whatever, for whatever reason, you know. But, uh, and sometimes with it comes uh, some emotions, you know, and sure. that we deal with. And oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes you guys pass them on to me <laughs> when, if, they, uh, if they get a little difficult. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's deadlines and it's, that's a good topic to talk about deadlines. Yeah. Yeah. I think t- Tuesday of this week, just thereafter when everybody, you know, we post the, post the list for everybody to see, and then it kind of catches their attention. Oh man, I should have already been entered by now. And you're right. It's, it is kind of frustrating. It makes for kind of a frustrating day because you're tiptoeing the line between, you know, being apologetic and, <laughs> yeah, and, and then also being, come on, you had, you had over 40 days here to enter. So, uh, but, uh, it, I, that's one thing that I learned from you early on is that uh, deadlines isn't something that we can have exceptions or, or exceptions for because after you you have an advertised deadline, you advertise it to everyone, it's not fair to all the other individuals who met that deadline to make an exception for one person who may have not for whatever reason, especially when you have that much time to enter. Well, not only isn't it fair, but we advertise that this this is this is the deadline. It's a hard deadline and no entries will be accepted after the deadline. So when we say no entries will be accepted – uh, we're putting that out there. So yeah. if we accept an entry after the deadline and uh, this entry beats you, well, uh, guess what? That doesn't, uh, that's a pretty tough one for us to defend. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, there's a lot of, there's, there's reasons we have deadlines, you know, and we can, we've talked about this a lot, you know, and, and, and I get it, you know, making extensions or this and that at some point you got to draw the line. You know, and I think for me is I always keep thinking it, it doesn't matter where you draw that line. There's always going to be that next person. So if you just stick with the advertised deadline, then that's what you're going by and going with. And it doesn't put us in a position that uh, where we uh, look like we're catering to this person. We let him in, but then the next day we didn't let this person in or we, you'd have to draw the line somewhere. Irregardless, you got to draw it somewhere. And there's the, one of the reasons for deadlines is that uh, for organizational purposes, we got to, you know, for get everything out to the clubs and just get everything in order. And that's all part of organizing organization of an event. And sometimes the difference between good organization and crappy organization. Yeah. You know, so um, and I feel for these guys that miss it. Uh, it, 
the other part of it is like you mentioned, you know, uh, man, most of these dogs have been qualified for a, a good while. You know, our entries opened up. When did they open up? First of February, February. first. Yeah. Yep. And that's not just this TOC. Uh, it seems like we got quite a few of them this year just for the TOC that just flat missed it. And there's a couple, couple I just feel terrible for them, you know, right. but uh, I just feel it's the best in, in our best interest to, we, we got to stick with it, you know, and otherwise, um, yeah. 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 As much as, as we'd love to have extra entries, you know, it helps everybody out, but. Sure. I uh, got to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. And the same can be said, hey, we're talking about pre-entry deadlines for major events, but the same can be said for entering an event the day of, you know, whenever it's a 7 p.m. hunt deadline and you show up at 7.05, it's easy enough to say, hey, I'm only five minutes late. Yeah. But then when the guy shows up at 7.07, yeah. he's only seven minutes late. Right. And it's uh, it, just having the one hard deadline can save a lot of a lot of trouble down the road. And the next thing we're going to talk about uh, is holes. <laughs> we uh, We've uh, we spent so much time on this podcast talking about how to score trees and dogs tree and but not a clear tree and coming into trees after the judge arrives and and it makes a lot of sense we hunt tree hounds but there are some uh, some things that happen out in the woods where sometimes you end up in places other than trees so let's kind of talk about that a little bit what happens when you end up in a hole or a brush pile or a tile or you know a culvert a fence row something like that it's a great topic and I know I've written about it I don't know if you have in the advisor columns you know but it's a uh... It's one that we haven't talked about in a while. It'd be a good one to, to hit it because, you know, in some parts of the country, I just had a conversation just this week. It came up, and that's probably why we have it on that's here. Right. It came, we had a couple of questions about whole situations uh, that got called in that happened at, at hunts. But there's certain parts of the country where you just don't see dogs uh, putting uh, uh, game in, in the ground. And oftentimes, if it is, it's not good. Oftentimes, you know, possum or what have you, you know. But there's other parts of the country where it's, quite common for uh, raccoons to take up in holes. It really is. And, you know, so if you're not used to it in certain parts of the country, like the one guy I spoke to uh, is from Louisiana. It's like, we just never had that in Louisiana. Coons did not hole up. Now he's moved to Ohio and he sees it quite frequently. And he's kind of like, man, how do we score these situations? A lot of water in all the holes down there in Louisiana. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Probably so. Probably so. <laughs> I th yeah, like you said, we there was a, a couple situations over the weekend, it seemed like, where uh, some questions arose. And I think that the biggest uh, misinterpretation of it was having to do with dogs that were at the hole that weren't declared treed. Mm -hmm. And the difference between that and mm -hmm. being treed but not declared treed on an actual tree. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're going to try to dispel that a little bit here and talk about some different situations. We've got mm -hmm. some different situations right. and scenarios to talk about. Uh, I think the the best place to start out is actually under Rule 5. Uh, the 5A is where, where it is, and it's under the circle point section. And uh, starting there because there's an in, important notation at the end of this uh, rule that we'll talk about. Uh, but rule 5A under the circle point section reads, when dogs strikes and trees on a tree or a hole in the ground where there could be a coon, yet judge does not see coon and no off game is seen. And the notation underneath it says, in case of running coon in a hole or place of refuge other than a tree, handler may call dog treat. May, it says there. However, if not called treed, cast may proceed to general area and track can be considered finished if dogs, by actions either tree barking or otherwise, show to the satisfaction of the judge coon to be there. One dog must show end of trail. Um, and then it talks about uh, if dogs are treated in a hole or a tile to see Rule 3B or 4G if applicable. And we'll get to those in just a second. But I uh, think we should probably talk about this situation here heading to dogs that aren't, aren't declared treed if you think they may be in a hole. Yeah. Yeah, I think the part that, uh, you know, that it's however, if not called treed, cast may proceed to general area. So that right there is is part of the rule that uh, that allows us to go to a dog without declaring a dog treed. You know, so, um, you know, and we're going to talk about the stationary rule here a little bit later, I think. And, and the two the two kind of are associated a little bit with the, with this topic. Absolutely. You know, so... Um, uh, but you can actually, you do not have to call a dog tree that you think is in a hole. You know, some guys, some handlers will kind of train or break their dogs from treeing or staying in holes, you know. And uh, and the reason for that is what? Probably most of them are going to say the obvious is uh, uh, is probably more times than not, it's off game. Or sometimes it is anyways, you know. And And that's all fine, you know, if that's the way you train. And that's probably also the reason I would never want to declare a dog tree that I think or I'm pretty confident is in a hole in the ground that I know is probably not going to stay. Right. You know, so, um, 
Uh, but yeah, you can. If you think your do- a dog is in a, is in a hole in the ground, or the judge does, nobody's calling it treed. Um, we'll, and we'll get to it. Instead of uh, putting the stationary on this dog, know that the rules allow us to go to these dogs without calling them treed. So uh, don't put the stationary on them. Just go score them. If yeah. they're not going to call them treed, you decide, you know, hey, we think the dogs are in something. And uh, go in there and check it out. If they are, uh, if they are in a hole in the ground, handle the dogs that are there. Now, if we call them, declare a dog treed, that dog has to stay and we have to wait the time. Right. If any dog is declared treed, we have to, that dog has to hold the three minutes, regardless whether it's a tree, a fence, or uh, a hole in the ground, anything. That dog has to stay. A declared treed dog has to stay for the three minutes. If it leaves for any reason, be it a hole, whatever. Uh, it's going to have to stay. And in that case, that would lock us in. Let's say, for instance, I had my dog declared treed. Uh, you did not tree yours, um, and you're not going to for fear of him maybe not staying or leaving or whatever. That's all perfectly fine, but you're going to have to wait on my three minutes before we're going to handle any dogs. Yeah. But the difference is if no dog is declared treed, uh, let's say they're all there already or what have you, uh, we can go to him right away. Yeah. Anytime. We don't have to wait the three minutes. And, and with the three minutes, most times you're not going to be there anyways in three minutes. So that's not that big of a deal, but yeah. Yeah. I think this is one of those important situations where it's important, you know, your dog and know it's barks, yep. and, you yep. know, if it's not, if it's uh hidden here and there, and it sounds like it's muffled a little bit, that's whenever you can make a pretty good assumption as a houndsman who hunts dogs, you know, if yeah. the dog isn't tringing right. And that is the one situation then when it comes to the scoring end of it, go in there and handle all dogs that are there. The rule says you read it out, said, uh, uh, let me go back to it. Um, one dog must show end of trail. And that's basically if you have a, a log pile or a rock pile or, or what have you, you know, a dog has to show you where this, where this track ended basically. Right. Um, I don't know this. I wasn't a part of, of implementing this rule, but I would assume a lot of times in a hole in the ground, there's probably only room for one dog, exactly. you know, so can't expect uh, four dogs to be in a hole, exactly. you know, so uh, oftentimes. So, but just one must show the end of the trail. In other words, can't just all be sitting around there looking at the sky, you know, somebody, we need to know that the track ended in this hole. And that's, you know, just something reasonable, but handle all the dogs that are right there to be handled. That's right. You know, so they don't necessarily have to be standing within a foot from the hole or what have you. You know, any dogs that are a part of it, that just takes some dog sense and, and common sense probably more than anything. Handle those dogs and score them. Yep. Any dog that was declared treed, you're going to score their strike and tree points. Any dog that was just uh, just not declared treed, just strike points only is what you're going to score. And it And here, it does not matter even if dogs... Let's say, for instance, uh, you're, we have a, a dog, my dog is at this hole or what have you, three minutes. Let's say I declared my dog treed. We wait the three minutes. Your dog never got there, but your dog was there even after the three minutes already expired. But before we got there, guess what? Your dog is still going to get scored at strike points. Yeah. That three minutes is irrelevant. Right. Only, the only part that is relevant for it is for a dog to get tree points. Yeah. Now, this is different. We're not talking about a dog that comes in after we've arrived. Rule 5B still applies to that, just the same as it would as if you were at a tree. But uh, So I think it's good we have this discussion, and, and hopefully it'll help some folks with, with scoring holes. Yeah, you, you mentioned it there, but I just want to give reference to where to find it under Rule 3B uh, in, in the plus point section. And that's 3B, it reads, When dog is declared struck and treed and coon is seen other than in tree, dog declared treed to receive strike and tree points plus. Uh, dogs not declared treed will get strike points only. There you go. So that that's 3B exactly, is exactly where to find that. That's the that's the rule I was talking about that we're going to use to to score dogs. You know, yeah. The difference between the two, and we're going to score them both, even if they weren't declared treed. Yeah, and and so I think it's a good idea to talk about some uh, different scenarios here. Yeah. Uh, let's let's yeah. talk about some yeah. of them. So the first one, uh, let's just talk about two dogs here to make it yeah. easy. Dogs yeah. A and B are declared struck, but neither are treed. Uh, we're both standing there just say mine and your dogs are struck in. They don't sound like they're treeing, but they're not moving from that spot, uh, kind of giving a bay and kind of tree bark there in that area. Doesn't sound right uh, in that situation. What are we going to do? Uh, obviously, the first thing, you don't need to tree your dog, and we're not going to in that situation uh, with us standing there. We're going to head to them and see what's happening um, if, if we think that they're in a place other than a tree, a tile drain or a brush pile or something like that. When we get in there, we notice that they are, in fact, doing that. We're going to handle them. Um, 
And since they're only struck, they're, they're only liable for their strike points, but they are going to be liable for their strike points since we handled them at that end of track. Correct. I think in the, a couple episodes ago on this podcast, we talked about uh, the one rule change where we no longer award tree points for anything, and that's the same thing here. You never never award tree points here either for right. dogs that didn't have tree, you know, weren't declared treed. Yeah. So when we get in there and handle them, there's always, we're talking, we talk about there's three outcomes there. First thing, the coon is seen. Yep. You're going to plus strike plus, points. Plus strike and tree points for those that were declared treated. In, yep. in our yep. situation here, we're yep. not treated in. We're okay, only we're not treated right in. You're right. Yep. Um, a second situation, the coon's not seen, but it could possibly be there. The hole goes too far for us to see the end of it. Uh, you know, different situations there it might be. What are you going to do with the strike points then? Easy. You're going to circle them. 5A. 5A. And then, uh, and then the last situation, it, we obviously see it's a, it's a hole. There's nothing there. It's obvious that they've uh, ran the end of this track and, and the coon isn't there. Then you're going to minus both of those. Might, points might have been a hole, but you can see everything in the hole. That's right. It has an ending to it. Yep. So, so yeah, there's 4G. That's where you minus that strike. That's why uh, rule 5A uh, refers to those different rules. Rule 3B, that would be plus points. 4G is minus points. Yep. Hey, let's, let's have a little bit of a different situation. And this is, this is kind of the one that happened over the weekend that we got the call about. In this situation, now it's a four dog cast. All four dogs get struck in. Doesn't really matter what their points are. We're not going to be tallying points here. We're just do, talking situational here. But let's just say two of the dogs are treated in. And the other two are not treated in, but they're all four struck in. So we proceed, uh, the three minutes run, we proceed to the, the two dogs that are treated in and we find them uh, on a creek bank and a hole in the edge of a creek, on the side of a creek bank. All four dogs are there. Whether they're struck or treated or not, all four dogs are handled. And we pull them back. We look in this hole and behind a big old tree root in the back of the hole, we see a coon balled up in the back. How do we score these dogs in this situation? Well, we, what we've been talking about, exactly. the, the ones that had were, uh, had were treed in, they're going to get plus strike and tree. And the ones that were not treed in, they're just going to get plus strike. Yep. And that, that's actually a question on our master of hounds test. And one that's probably missed a little bit too much. Uh, if they just see that, uh, that number three there, three yeah. B, they would, they would get that one right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's one thing, one other situation or scenario we could add to it. I don't think you have it on here, but let's say one of those dogs was shut out on strike. In other words, let's say the, the first dog was already declared struck and treed before dog D, the last dog was even declared struck. Yeah. Even in this case, he's considered to be shut out on this. This uh, hole can be the same situation. You can be shut out on a hole, just like you can be shut out on a tree. Yeah. So it would get deleted strike points, has no strike points to two minus. Exactly. If you're if you're shut out. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the same exact situation that we just talked about with the four dogs struck in, two are treated in, two aren't, and it's circled. You're just going to circle it, them accordingly, whatever points they have. You don't ever uh, add additional points, like you said. You don't add additional tree points for those other dogs. Yep. And that's the same situation if the hole's minus. Um, in that situation, A and B are going to be minus both ways, and C and D are going to be minus on their strike points because we're not going to give an additional or next available tree points for those dogs. Yeah. There's, there is one other situation there that I, I think we can make another scenario there is let's say you do see the raccoon in there and the dogs get a hold of it. Anytime yeah. they get a hold of it, at that point, it becomes coon caught. Right. You know, in that case, even those dogs that were declared treed, they cannot get tree points. Anymore. That's exactly right. And but, I do have it. It's a rule three C for for reference on that. Okay. If you okay. if you yeah. if a dog's caught, then it, you're going to get your strike yeah. points only, even if you treat in. Yeah. That's per rule three C. Yep. You know, okay. just delete your tree points and give them strike points only. Yeah. Plus strike points. And just one, and it kind of seems overkill here, but you know we have some time here. I figure it's good to yeah. uh, to talk them all out. There's one more situation here uh, to talk about that has to do with with this situation. Let's just say me and you are hunting again. We're only two dogs in the cast, struck for 175. Um, and it, it kind of sounds like our dogs are in a hole. It's something doesn't sound right. We hear them here and there, but when we do hear them, they're, they're treeing pretty hard. So we head in there to them. Uh, we find them on the, on the side of a deep Creek bank or something. That's and kind of muffled. called them treed, right? That's right. They're struck only. And not called treed. Yep. We get in there, they're on the side of this Creek bank. That's kind of muffling their sound. So that's why we're hearing them sometimes and hear them, not hear them sometimes, but they are in fact treed on the side of a tree. Uh, in that situation, what, what do we do in that situation? Yeah. And that's a good one to bring up because it can happen. They might be, because they sound different, they might have been jumping up and down the bank and, exactly. you know, and, and that muffled or whatever. You know, sometimes it's uh, even a dog you've hunted for a while. It's like, gosh, darn, what's he doing? You know, what is that? Does, does not sound right. Right. Uh, but in this case, that's a good question where a lot of guys are going to make the mistake. They're going to go in there and handle them. Ah, uh, wrong. 
Right. Just back out, back out and you can call them tree. Yep. You know, I think at the, at this point, you know, um, technically at this point, you know, I think the fairest thing to do would be to split tree points. Exactly. I agree. You know, uh, in, in a case like that, you know, cause they are in fact on a tree, but don't handle them where you are going to muddy things up quickly is when you go to handle them, just stop, uh, whoop. They are on a tree. What do we do now? Just call them tree. Yep. And then wait your time. Well, in this case, um, well, you know, yeah, if, if is, they're the only two dogs, yeah. we just, we don't have to wait on any, anybody else. But if we have a dog at large, obviously we'd have to wait the three minutes. Yeah. That, that's a good, that's a good call. That's there. a good scenario there. I'm glad you brought that up. Yep. Yeah. And I had some additional notes here. I think that we've already talked about them all. Like you said, 3C, there's the one that talks about dogs uh, then catching a coon. The second one to remember, shut out still takes precedence over this. So uh, be sure to notate if a dog shut out, it's still strike points are still going to be deleted if it's on the tree that it's sh- tree or even hole that it was shut out on. Yeah. And then uh, the next, the last thing here is talking about the stationary. Um, and that's something that we're going to talk about here right after our break is the stationary. Uh, but before you put on a stationary on a dog, if there's any question at all on whether this dog is treed or if it's at a hole, you know, that handler probably knows. And there's probably a reason it's not treeing its dog unless it's some sort of situational defense this handler's playing but in most cases in most cases that handler's gonna say he just doesn't sound right there's there's something yeah. he's yeah. not not sound like he's treed like usual and and if you're a judge and you're putting the stationary on the hound you guys have to know that that dog's treed to put yeah. the stationary on it yeah and always try to not meaning anything negative but but just uh with judges uh, giving judges advice i guess and and i'll say it for myself i'll use myself as if i'm judging and we've got a dog that is stationary, meaning the dog is just, the dog is there barking. It's not going anywhere. The dog is typically stationary, and that's what we call the stationary rule. You know, to uh, uh, the judge would normally put, uh, you know, the stationary rule on him. But I always try to tell guys, don't put the station, only, the only time you should put the stationary on a dog is if, in your mind, the dog is, in fact, treeing on a tree, and number two, for whatever reason, the handler is just not going to tree his dog. Right. Don't do it just right away. As soon as the dog locates and boom, you know, give it some time. You know, just just let it, let the, sometimes handlers will need to let their dog settle in a little bit. Maybe if they're the first dog there, the rest of them are a good ways away. Give them time to, you know, I'm not going to be nearly as quick to call my dog treed if there's no, no other dog around there. I'm going to make sure everything's good. So don't rush the guy either. But at some point, he's going to have to call this dog treed. And I'm not saying two minutes later, but give him plenty enough time, reasonable amount of time. And then if it's just apparent, he is just not going to call the tree, uh, the dog treat until I force him to, then I'm going to put the stationary time on him. And that's a five minute clock. But uh, where I was getting at with this is if I put the stationary on your dog and we go in there and he is in a hole in the ground or a place of refuge or something, I should feel pretty bad. I should feel like, man, because what I just, essentially what I did is I forced you to tree your dog. Yeah. Now, somebody may say, well, if he does, he doesn't have to, and you're not going to get scratched if he's not on a tree. That's true. But more times than not, you are probably going to go ahead and tree your dog and get in there. And, and then, uh, heaven forbid, he doesn't scoot out of there when he sees the lights coming because you've got him halfway trained to not stay in holes or whatever, you know. So, yeah. So, and that's why be, you don't. Uh, put the stationary on a dog that you think is could be in a in a place of refuge or a hole in the ground because we already have a rule that we just talked about a little bit ago that you can go to dogs without calling them treat. So let's continue our stationary discussion a little bit. And I'm going to start out here by reading Rule 6M, and you'll find Rule 6M under the handler-related scratch and defense section of our rule book. And it reads, if handler fails to declare treat a dog obviously treeing, which is a, d- a judge's decision, for a period of five minutes, Dog may be declared treed while five is running, but not after the five has expired. Judge must verify a dog to be at a tree before it can be scratched. If the cast is in the process of shining a separate tree, time shall be canceled or not be applied to another dog. So we'll we'll unload that last sentence later on. But uh, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the stationary first. I think the first thing to notate and and uh, uh, everybody needs to know is that the stationary time is five minutes instead of three minutes, which is what mm-hmm. our tree time is. Yeah. You know, the, the tree time changed in 2019, I guess, but that did not, that went to three minutes tree time, but the stationary time re- still remained at five. Yep. Yep. So still five minutes. Yeah. And and you kind of alluded this to this a little bit right there at the end of our last discussion about holes, but 
Uh, just for judges out there who who are curious about the stationary, we're just going to be kind of explaining the stationary rule a little bit. When do you apply the stationary? And like you said, there's there's a couple different things that you got to have. And I'll just gloss over them real quick since you yeah. already kind of went a little bit mm-hmm. deeper on them. And that's the dog's obviously treeing. But obviously, being a judge, you need to use your best judgment and your be- and your experience as a houndsman to know that that dog's on is on a tree, yeah, and not in a a hole or a tile or on a mm-hmm. fence or a barn or somewhere else other than a tree. And the last thing is, uh, it's it's obvious that the handler's not calling their dog treat for whatever reason. Yeah, and then after all that, then you should start the start the time. And let's talk about some different situations that break the stationary. Perfect. Um, it may, uh, the first one here, handler tree and their dog. That's the obvious one. Uh, yep. That one's going to put uh, the the handler, uh, give them, put a little uh, fire under them when you put the stationary on them. They're going to have to tree their dog or, or face the consequences if their dog's obviously tree. Yep. yep. Uh, second one, if the dog moves. Again, that's a judge's decision to tell you whether a dog has moved off a tree or not. Mm-hmm. Um, the cask can... Yep. Disagree with that. You're that talking about to. a dog you've got uh, the stationary working on it. It was treeing here and now it shuts up and moves elsewhere, barks elsewhere. The judge should just immediately uh, 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 drop the stationary on it. That's right. Lift the stationary, I guess, is what we always called it. Uh, third one here stationary is, and this is an interesting here, and, and we'll talk about this one a little bit more in depth maybe, but uh, the stationary is broke if the dog shuts up. And then at that time, when it shuts up, that triggers a two minute clock, same as when you put it on tree time. And that two minute clock has to an exp- expire if you don't hear an off bark by the dog in a different direction for that, for the stationary to, to finally be broken. That two yep. minute clock has to expire. Yep. If the two gets the dog here, you're going to lift the stationary just like you would minus a dog if the dog was declared treat. Yep. And that's a, I, we, I've had some discussion with folks about that. And that kind of, if you're, if the stationary is on your dog, you have to think about that a little bit. It, it is. And I think we're going to talk into, about a little different scenario. You might get caught in a situation where the, where the time is running. And by the time the, uh, well, I guess here we go. We're talking about it already. <laughs> you know, so let's say, let's say you've got the five running and last yeah. two minutes of the hunt or last two minutes of this five, you know, maybe three and a half minutes in the dog shuts up. Yeah. You know, and now the judge, me, I'm going to start my two minute clock on this dog. And let's say, for instance, it goes another minute and 40 seconds before it barks again. Why uh, now you're you can't call your dog treat anymore, you know, because the dog's not barking, right? So you're kind of in a you're you're kind of in a pickle there. But a, a good handler will think of that, and it's probably always best if you don't let it let that stationary time slide down to the last two minutes of the five, just to keep something from that like that from happening. That'd be a pretty helpless feeling yeah. not being able to treat your dog. That, yeah, that situation. No kidding. You know, if the two. It's fine if the two ends up getting the dog, but let's say the two doesn't get the dog and, and it starts treeing again. Now, now you don't have the opportunity to call it anymore. But, uh, but for that, we always say, hey, you had plenty of time to call your dog treat here before this, you exactly. know, so no exactly. excuses. Yeah, exactly. Don't make any. Uh, next one here. Uh, the the stationary is lifted when shine time has started on another dog's tree. Um, there's a little notate here. I just have you continue on to the tree and start shine time at a normal pace. Yep. You don't yep. stall for the dog or anything like that. But um, if if you start and start shine time on another dog's tree, and that's the last. The You're last talking about a separate of, tree. That's right. Yeah. That's the last sentence on the on the rule six in that we talked about there, uh, talking about uh, if the cast is in the process of shining a separate tree, time shall be canceled or not be applied to another dog. Right. So. And then just the last one I have here is obviously stationary will be broken at the conclusion of hunt time or if a timeout is called in accordance with the rule seven. So those are the situations that are going to break the stationary. Um, and the other one that I would add on to that, any, uh, uh, any, any time you have the stationary running on a dog and you can no longer judge that dog. And that's why while you're shining another tree, you need to focus on shining this tree. That's right. Uh, you just lift the time on that dog. Yeah. And it's not like if the dog, if, two minutes had went by after you're done shining this other split tree. If the dog now only has three minutes left, no, you would have to restart it if that's the case. But it's okay for judges to um, lift their stationary on a dog if they're concentrating on something else somewhere else. Yeah. Like or, any other yeah. scoring situations. Yeah. Maybe you're in, uh, let's say you're in West Virginia and the dog, you, you, this dog's obviously treating over here, but there's another dog tree over here. We got to dip down in the solar. Yep. You got to use your best common sense yep. there to know. He's going to walk out of hearing of the dog or whatever, lift it. Yep. yep. Exactly. All right. So let's say uh, there's stationary running on a different dog in the cast. What? How does that affect me as a, another handler of the cast? Uh, nothing. Nothing for my hound changes. I'm still going to call my dog struck, call my dog tree. We're going to advance to my trees. 
And then obviously shine and recast dog stationary doesn't affect any of that. That's just an extra time running yeah. on another dog in the cast. Doesn't affect me at all. Yeah. I, I, one that I don't think you have on here unless I missed it is that if another dog comes in and trees with this dog on the same tree and that dog gets called treed, uh, that takes precedent. Now, now the three minute clock is on. That's right. And that stationary is lifted on that dog. And now he is, uh, now he also is on the three minute clock. Got to be in that same, yep. same area of the yep. tree, right? Yep. So, all right, let's see. Uh, and and now, lastly, what happens? And stationary runs out. What do we do then, as a as a judge in the cast? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to proceed to the state to the dog that the stationary caught the time on, um, and then keep a reminder. If you're the judge, you have to get there and you have to verify that the dog is in fact tree and not in a different place of rip. Yeah, and this is a little bit different. There's other registries that have a stationary rule, and if they're not called treat in five minutes, they're just simply scratched at that point not here we got to go in and check the dog and verify the dog to actually be on a tree and if it is it's scratched yep, yep. and then uh, like you said uh, what happens to it after it's elapsed and the judge has verified it the dog will be scratched from the hunt yep. simple as that yep alan we both had dog pathfinder twos now for a little while what do you think about yours I'm liking mine. One of the things I had the opportunity to now download a map of an area where I did not have service and I've used it there and it has worked flawlessly. I love it. Yeah. I love the crystal clear maps. I love that I'd never lose reception on my dog's collars anymore. Highly recommended by me as well. Dog Trip Pathfinder 2, the official GPS collar partner of UKC. Yeah. So, uh, so kind of moving on to the next thing here, we're kind of done with our rules discussion for now, but we're going to uh, kind of transition over to talking about our Coonhound Bench Show Hall of Fame, Grand Champion Hall of Fame dogs. Okay, yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about our Grand Night Champion Hall of Fame dogs. Uh, for the Grand Champion Hall of Fame dogs, we have just too many of them, to be honest. There's, there's 64 of them total, so we're going to kind of break them up, and over the next few Coonhound episodes, we're going to talk about a, a couple of breeds at a time. And today, we're going to talk about Black and Tans and Leopards. Um, but first, we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about how to achieve the Grand Champion Hall of Fame title. So it's a, it's a little bit different than, than the night hunt where it's purely based on cast wins and we got away from uh, points, uh, any points accruing in the register division. In the show, there's still, there's still a accrual of points there that get you to your, uh, to your first show champion title. Right. And to become a show champion, it's going to take 100 championship points with one best, uh, best of show, whether you're hunting a, or showing a male or female, a best female or best male of show, with competition at either the class breed or show level. So just as long as you defeat one dog in the course of the show. And that can be a dog of any other breed that is a, that is also a male or a female. It doesn't have to be in your breed. Right. And it the, can, but it doesn't have to be. That's right. Both would be considered competition. Right. And, and those a hundred points must be shown under two separate judges and uh, a rule change that some people, it was in our last rule change, but I still get some calls about it now is, is the point totals. It kind of shifted back in 2020 when the new, when that rule book came out, uh, the last rule book, uh, five points for a class win, 10 for a breed win, 15 for a show win. So you can get a total of 30 points at one show if you get best of show. So now it actually requires four, four best of shows to finish out if you go that route. Uh, once you make show champion, it takes eight champion wins to be a grand champion. In that, in that category, you have to be under three separate judges, so eight wins under three separate judges to get your grand champion title. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just like the, uh, the Night Hunt Hall of Fame stuff, every eight grand champion wins. Once you make grand champion, every eight wins, you go up a multiplier. So eight grand champion wins to two, 16 to three, 24 to four, 32 to five, and then it's actually another additional eight to make your grand champion Hall of Fame title. Mm -hmm. So 40 total grand champion wins will get you that grand champion Hall of Fame title. And uh, just one last notation, just like in the champion division, every uh, every multiplier, you have to go under at least three different judges, which is, uh, that's commonplace. You're not going right. to get eight wins yep. otherwise. So just to, before we get into the black and tans, let's talk a little bit about the numbers. This list was compiled back on February 28th, so just a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't think that there's any new ones since then. I double-checked it and there hasn't been. Um, 64 dogs have a grant, have achieved the title, to, like I said, and uh, today we're going to be talking about black and tans and leopards. Nine black and tans have achieved the title, and two leopards have. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the black and tans a little bit. Uh, the first one here, we have Grand Champion Hall of Fame, Allen's Handyman's Shelby. Uh, this is a female born in July of 2010, owned by Allen Moore of R Rivesville, West Virginia. 
Yeah, this dog is sired by Grand Knight Champion, Grand Champion, Hashman's Hillbilly Handyman, and his dam is Hashman's Midnight Final Destiny. Dog was bred by Brian Hashman, has 102, uh, that can't be right, 102 Grand Champion wins total. Is that, that right? That is right. Is yes. that right? That is right. Yep. Are you kidding me? Really wow. been uh, been at it. And uh, when we first did this, when we talked about uh, how we went back to 2009 for the night hunts, it actually came about a year before um, the bench shows did. Uh, for bench show dogs, we went back to 2010, so 10 years. And so this dog right here would have been right on the, cups, the cusp of it. Uh, so 102. Well, it, yeah, it earned the title back in 2012 already. So, wow, that's, <laughs> that's we were, we were uh, talking about the Walker female, the, the uh, Katie dog, yes. here a couple of episodes ago where she was in the Hall of Fame in the, on the hunt side as well as the show side. But, uh, wow, this dog's right up there as well. Yeah. yeah I was not one. aware of that uh, until if, right now is the first time I even <laughs> saw that. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> this is one of three dogs that currently ha have over 100 grand champion wins. And the other one, one being Katie, like you said, and one mm -hmm. being uh, an older Walker right. male that the seats have too. So yeah. we'll get to that one in a few episodes. Hey, but. congratulations to Brian Hashman. And Mr. Hashman there. Mm -hmm. uh, next one here, Grand Knight Champion, Grand Champion Hall of Fame, Little Black Walnut Genesis. Uh, this is a female black and tan born in January of 2012. And it's owned by David Harrison of Carthage, Missouri. Yeah, this dog is off of Grand Night Champion Raw Kansas Jammer, and the dam is Grand Night Champion Northern Night Still Cloudy, bred by Dan Doherty. 15 uh, Grand Champion wins total earned in June of 2013. Yeah, this is, this is a well-bred dog here. Uh, uh, this, is a, this little dog here was owned by Val Nelson at one time. Okay. Yeah, I know he owned this dog, uh, in, uh, and it's one that he was, uh, he's, a, he's a walker dog guy, but I remember it was a black and tan that he had, and he was really high on this dog and, and the dog did a lot of winning. So yeah. yeah, I was not aware that he ever sold the dog, but I see he did. He sold it to uh, David Harrison. Our third one here and the third black and tan to achieve the title would be grand champion hall of fame, Cherokee star gazer. Uh, this is a male black and tan born in June of 2016. And the owner on this dog is William Walters too, out of Belton, South Carolina. Yeah, we have uh, one of our field reps lives in Belton, Philip South Carolina. Foster Country. Yeah, so I assume they probably know each other. Uh, this dog is is uh, out of a well known show dog, a national two time national grand night cha or grand champion, and a grand champion to Margaritaville Lucky Old Son. Uh, that dog needs no introduction in the show ring. Has produced a lot of he won a lot of shows himself and is. Uh, has been a, a magnificent reproducer. Uh, female is Grand Champion PR Night Music. Uh, this dog was bred by Mr. Francis White. Francis is one of the uh, old legends in the sport. I, I think he lives in Virginia. I think Virginia or in that part of the country somewhere. Uh, but 47 uh, Grand Champion wins on this dog earned in 2019. Yeah, you talk about lucky old son there. We keep bringing him up, it seems like. As we're talking about the top 10 Ben Show list, yeah. talking about the Hall of Fame list now. He's not only is he did he do a lot of winning, but he's doing a lot of reproducing. Yeah, I talked to his owner here. Uh, uh, I think it was at the Winter Class, and we were talking about that and talking about some of his offspring that's just done so well. And, you know, it means just goes it speaks a whole lot of, of uh, good breeders out there and what it means to them to see dogs offspring it means just as much to them to send more probably see their offspring of their dogs do so well just and and uh this is a good example of that yeah our next dog here is grand champion hall of fame anderson's okay black chigger speaking of one that we talked about for the top 10 i know this dog just competed at the top 10 bench show at the winter classic this year uh chigger is a female black and tan born in june of 2020 so just a young dog yet and it's owned by donnie neoka and cheryl anderson of broken arrow oklahoma yeah, the dog is off of Grand Knight Champion Kentucky River X Man and is off of N and M's Black Bottom Miss Joe D. Uh, this dog was bred by Andrew Nall and Luann Metzger. They're from Oklahoma. Uh, that we see at Black and Tan Days Autumn Oaks. We see them every year. Seems like if they have a dog in the finals or, or at the World Finals, we'll see them there. Fifty-eight Grand uh, Champion wins total. Uh, earned the degree just this last year in June of 2022. Yeah. Another another dog out of some good hunting stock there that's yep. uh, having a lot of the luck in the shows. Yep. Uh, next one here, Grand Champion Hall of Fame, Small Times Split Second Striker. Uh, this is a male black and tan born in August of 2014, and it's owned by Jesse and Angela Brooks of Wyoming, Ontario, Canada. 
Yeah, Canadian dog here is off of Grand Champion Small Time Bullet in the chamber. And the dam is Grand Champion Small Time Split Second Decision, uh, bred by Terry Dolbear of Canada. Uh, Dolbear. 48 Grand Champion wins earned in June of 2022. Yeah, that's uh, I've got to meet Terry for the first time at Black and Tan Days this year. You know, when I came on, it wasn't long after uh, whenever the whole COVID thing happened and it was tough to cross the border and all that stuff. And in 2020, they didn't, the Black and Tan Days was canceled. 2021, uh, she wasn't there, but in 2022, she came uh, to, uh, it was an only, only yeah, Illinois and right. got to see her dogs yeah. and uh, some great dogs that she yeah. has. Uh, next one here, one that we've talked about on this on this show a few times, I feel like. Confirmation champion, Grand Field champion, Grand Champion Hall of Fame, Grand Water champion three, Scarberry's Mark of Carbon. Uh, this is a male black and tan, born in August of 2016. And it's owned by Colby and Robert Scarberry of Glenwood, West Virginia. Yeah, this dog sired by Grand Champion Shawnee Hills Shades of Carbon HTX and Grand Champion Scarberry's Midnight Black Gem was the dam. Uh, bred by the Scarberries, Colby Scarberry, shown as the owner on or the breeder on record. Forty Grand Champion wins, uh, degrees uh, earned this degree in August of 2022. Yeah, we keep talking about their dogs. They do a great job of competing. So yeah, they do. Them. Yeah, they do. Uh, here's the Andersons again. Here's the other one that they they had in the top ten this past year. That's Grand Champion Hall of Fame Andersons. Okay, handsome hoss. This is a male born in June of 2020, and it's also owned by Donnie, Neoka, and Cheryl Anderson of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Yeah, this dog is out of Grand Night Champion 2, Scipio, Kansas, TJ. I guess I pronounced that correctly. Scipio? Does that sound right? Well, you'd have to ask Blaze, yeah. I guess. <laughs> uh, and the dam is Waters Mountain Black Bella bred by Troy Cornell. 40 Grand Champion wins earned in October of 22. I uh, got a couple more black and tans left here. We got Grand Champion Hall of Fame Outlaw Country Lucky Lady. Uh, it's a female black and tan born in January of 2016, and it's owned by Roger and Brandon Crawford of Cache, Cache Oklahoma. Yeah, this dog is out of uh, off of Field Champion Grand Champion Four Laurel uh, Valley Doc Holiday HTX and Grand Champion PR Briar Valley Crazy Lady is the dam, uh, bred by uh, Dave Myers from Pennsylvania. 40 Grand Champion wins earned it in October of 2022. A lot of them just here recently yeah. seem like. Yep. So yep. That's good to see. And yep. we talked a little bit about uh, Lucky Old Son, uh, his offspring. When you talk about some of his most successful offspring, Doc Holliday definitely has to be in that conversation. Yep, yep. He's one of them. So here's a grandson of the old of the old uh, Lucky Old Son dog. Already in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Um, And rounding out the or black. female. That was a female, actually. Uh, rounding out the black and tans here is uh, another Scar Scarberry dog here. Confirmation champion, Grand Champion Hall of Fame, Scarberry's Midnight Black Ruby. This female was born in August of 2016, and it's owned by Colby and Robert Scarberry of Glenwood, West Virginia. Yeah, again, off of uh, Shawnee Hills Shades of Carbon HTX and Scarberry's Midnight Black Gem. So uh, a full, full, I guess they're litter mates, right? I didn't look at the birth date of the other one, but I guess they are born in 2016. Yeah, they are yep, litter they mates. are litter mates. Littermate, so again, um, 40, 40 grand champion wins total and earned this degree in November of this last year, 2022. That's impressive by them. They, yeah. To, to Colby Scarberry is the breeder, obviously, here again, too, as well. So, yeah. And then we have just a couple American Leopard Hounds that have achieved the Grand Champion Hall of Fame title and a couple that will uh, uh, probably dogs that you've heard of over and over again. These dogs have been winners for, for a few years now. Uh, first one to get the title was confirmation champion, grand champion Hall of Fame, CNM's Harley Quinn. Uh, this female leopard hound was born in November of 2016, and it's owned by Angela Carpenter and Katie Millwood, Silva, North Carolina. Yeah, Angela's from North Carolina there, but I've uh, I've seen Harley for, he's a little bit older dog. He, I always thought it was a male, but it is actually a female. Well, female. Huh? Yeah, Harley Quinn's is actually a female. So uh, the dog is out of confirmation champion, grand champion to Thunderstruck Silver Nugget. Nugget. And the dam is uh, Thunderstruck H&A's Indigo Sky. That was uh, bred by uh, Haley Creaseman. Yep. Uh, she's from the Carolinas as, as well over there. Uh, 40 grand champion wins total. And this degree was earned in April of 2022. So another dog that earned it just this last year. Yeah, I'm going to throw another one in there. This is the second and uh, last Leopard Hound to achieve the Grand Champion Hall of Fame title uh, just a few weeks later. Looks like uh, this is Grand Champion Hall of Fame preaching to the choir. 
Uh, this dog is a male leopard born in June of 2013, and it's owned by Abby McCorkle of Elwood, Indiana, and Jessica Warner over in West Virginia. Yeah, this dog is off of Lakers Scar and Lakers Striking Annie the bre- that was bred by Rex Laker. Rex is from Illinois, and I've actually uh, I bought a leopard pup off of Rex one time. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so he... Uh, he hunted most of his dogs, you know, and had some and had some really good ones. So this is one of those preaching to the choir. Uh, this dog has a grand total of forty six grand champion wins and uh, earned this degree in April of twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah. So like we talked about, there's sixty four total dogs that have this, and I uh, didn't want to rush them. I want to give them all their their due yeah. credit of it. Uh, Split so, it up a little bit. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. But now that we're we're done going through the through the black and tans and leopards there that have achieved the title. Thought we may talk about some of the breakdowns a little bit. So obviously nine black and tans, uh, two leopards have achieved the title. Uh, our next one that we'll talk about, we'll probably do blue ticks by themselves. Eighteen blue ticks have achieved the Grand oh, Champion yeah. Hall of Fame title. Yeah, blue ticks. So that's the most we have right now. Walkers probably have walkers. A few. Yeah, yeah, walkers is the most. Yeah, that's uh, pretty impressive. Eighteen blue ticks, and then nine English hounds have achieved this title. Uh, five plots. Two red bones, and then leading the way, 19 tree and walkers. Yeah. Just one above the blue ticks. So yeah. Maybe there's a little bit of a competition there between those two those yeah. two breeds. Yeah. Uh, the male-female breakdown is really, really close. 33 males have achieved the Grand Champion Hall of Fame title. Uh, 31 females. And then the state breakdown. You know, whenever I think about dogs getting a bunch of Grand Champion wins, I kind of think about the middle of the country with being in the middle of a bunch of uh, clubs everywhere and having mm. local events everywhere every weekend. But West Virginia leads the way with really? 11 dogs on this list. Yeah. Uh, next would be Missouri and Ohio with seven each. Uh, North Carolina has six. Tennessee has five. Illinois with four. Kentucky leads the way in a lot of the night hunt stuff, but they're falling behind here with three, uh, three dogs with the Grand Champion Hall of Fame title uh, tied with Ohio there. Uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, and New York have two, and then uh, with one each is Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Indiana, Maryland, Nebraska, South Carolina, Virginia, Vermont, Wisconsin, and the one can, the one doll from Canada. Yeah, well, it sounds like uh, Christina Officer and a few of her cohorts there in Kentucky need to get with the program. Going to have to rally the troops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, when we were talking about talking about the the Hall of Fame dogs, one thing that we want to do is once we get through all of them here in the show, and we'll obviously talk about we have just one field trial dog and two water race dogs, then we're going to plan on just announcing and talking about the dogs as they make the title on that week's episode that we're doing. And that'd be good. I and think I think that's work. a good way yeah. to kind of give them their individual, right. you know, recognition that yeah. they deserve for earning yeah. that title. So, but yeah, hey, congratulations to all of these folks that have uh, done so well with their dogs in the shows and, and earned these, uh, these degrees on their dogs. So we, uh, we appreciate them and appreciate their support and congratulations to them and all the breeders as well. Thank you for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow so you don't miss any of our new episodes or content.